Chapter 13 End of Days Your ratings are worse than Mrs. Thatcher's and are most unpopular. But don't worry, we can turn this round. The cheery tones of Conservative Party Chairman Jake Berry hit me as I sat in the car on the way to a business uh, visit ahead of the Conservative Party conference in Birmingham. I had been avoiding the media for days, and now my bubble had been well and truly burst. It was Friday the 30th of September, exactly a week since the announcement of the growth plan now universally described as the mini-budget. I had expected difficulties, but the chain of events that had been unleashed had not been predicted by anyone. We had got a position reaction from the supporters of change, but from our opponents, we were facing a full-blown feeding frenzy. With a precarious international market, arrestive media, agitating politicians, and the establishment all egging each other on. Contrary to my previous optimism, I now saw that we were operating in an environment that was deeply hostile to the economic policies we were advancing. Tax cuts, supply-side reform, and public spending restraint. We simply weren't ready for this level of onslaught. We did not have enough supporters willing to vocally defend our position. Our political infrastructure was weak and very newly established. This was all intertwined with a poisoned political well. A significant number of Conservative MPs remained unhappy with my election to the leadership and were not willing to give us a chance. They objected to the removal of environmental red tape, which allowed us to get on with fracking and build more houses. They objected to the focus of the economy at the expense of subjects like net zero. They objected to the speed of implementation. They did not seem to understand that the UK was heading towards an economic cliff with its surging debt and that I was seeking to conduct a handbrake turn to avoid driving off the edge. I could see worse was ahead for the British economy. Those on my economic team agreed with the prognosis. I had talked the situation through with Simon Clark, then Chief Secretary to the Treasury, as we had walked through the woods at Sheving in August making our preparations. Simon, with typical understatement, had suggested that we were in for a bracing time. I had said it would be a commotious six months of turbulence and we would have to batten down the hatches, but we agreed it was the only way to get things on the right track. The alternative was an economic economy, increased taxes and a likely brutal defeat for the Conservatives at the 2024 election. I knew the party conference to which I was heading would be difficult. I needed to keep the cabinet on board, deal with restive MPs and not show any chinks in my armour until which my opponent would be only too willing to stick the knife. The backdrop was not promising. Much of the market turmoil had been generated in the US, which we had not expected or been briefed on. Jerome Powell, chair of the Federal Reserve, had reversed policy in early 2022 after keeping interest rates too low for too long. In March 2022, he started a cycle of interest rate rises, taking the federal funds rate from 0 to 0.25% 0 to 3 to 3.25% 3 by September 2022. The bond market collapsed, and the 10-year US Treasury yield rose from 0.172% on the 1st of March 2022 to 4.01% on the 18th of October, barely seven months later. Monetary policy had been reversed, and the annual growth in the main measure of the US money supply, M2, went negative in November 2022, after having had its largest expansion since the American Civil War during 2020. The bond markets had failed to anticipate this and went into a tailspin. The change in interest rates expectations led to a surge in the dollar. All these things caused knock-on effects and chaos in other countries, including in the UK. As expected, the pound had fallen relative to the dollar following the mini-budget on the Friday, but the fall did not trigger a huge alarm since it was within the Treasury's expectations, albeit at the upper end. The pound had also dropped the day before, 
to its weakest position in 37 years, after the Bank of England had increased interest rates by less than expected. Analysts concluded that the bank had missed market expectations, and there was increased pressure for further rate rises. The Bank of England had also embarked on a programme of quantitative tightening on the eve of the budget, announcing a plan to sell £40 billion of gilts, becoming the first major bank to sell quantitative easing bonds. This selling of bonds raised the yields as the supply of bonds was increased, pushing up the cost of government borrowing on the eve of the mini-budget. Although the dollar was strong following a rate rise by the Federal Reserve, the pound had not been alone. The yen was also suffering. Yet the fall of the pound was blamed by the media entirely on the mini-budget. I expected the initial market jitters to settle and was more concerned about convincing malcontents on the conservative benches that we were now on the right track. This was a battle I believed had to be won and for which I was prepared. What I did not realise was that things were about to get a whole lot worse. One of the media team mentioned to me that they were having to field questions about the market reaction because the Treasury plan team was not stepping up. This worried me because I had been under the impression the Treasury media operation would be in full swing. This, after all, is what they do. They live for budgets, mini or otherwise. After a calmish weekend, during which I invited my team over to Sheving for a barbecue, Checkers was undergoing some refurbishment, I was hit with news of turbulence in the Asian markets on Monday morning. There had been a further fall in the pound against the dollar overnight and a rise in UK gilt yields. I was surprised that this was panicking everyone. As a committed believer in floating currencies, I didn't think the current value of the pound was a central issue. Yet, even though the pound had fluctuated wildly over the past year, the media started tracking it as a marker of success. As I headed back to Downing Street, it became clear even more trouble was ahead. Quasi had done a bullish TV interview on Laura Kunzberg's BBC show on Sunday, but it since shifted into a much more cautious gear. He had apparently been up all night fretting about the market movements. What neither of us knew was that the UK was sitting on a financial tinderbox. Our pension funds were uniquely exposed to liability-driven investments. The UK had a significant proportion of the world's supply of these products, which meant that every time interest rates went up, there would be demands for cash. This then became a vicious circle. The risk was that these pension funds and fund managers would go bust, leading to a cataclysmic economic fallout. During the era of cheap money, pension funds had found it hard to make a return. Therefore, therefore they essentially bet on low interest rates. Organisations like BlackRock were particularly exposed. That bet was now looking like a massive mistake because those low interest rates and the cheap money were unsustainable. This was a crisis waiting to happen. Once the cost of borrowing rose, interest rates had already started increasing in December 2021. And further rises were inevitable regardless of the mini-budget. However, the market reaction triggered by the Bank of England's inaction on interest rates and QT had exposed the problem and brought it to a head. I was astonished to discover no one in the Treasury or the Bank of England had flagged it as a problem and that had only ever become aware of it when contacted by nervous pension fund managers that Friday morning. Despite helping to prepare our announcements, the Treasury had been blindsided by this major structural risk. It really was a tinderbox waiting for a spark, and the market upheaval approved it. One of the reasons we failed to communicate this to the media is we didn't fully understand what was happening ourselves. I hadn't heard of LDIs, and neither had most Treasury officials. One of the impacts of removing so much expertise from the Treasury and putting it into the Bank of England and the OBR. We certainly didn't realise it was going to turn into a major issue. We struggled both to understand and to explain what was happening. In a 24-hour news cycle, this is fatal. When I arrived back in Downing Street on Monday, 
Quasi told me the Bank of England felt obliged to make a statement to calm things down. They might even need to step in and implement an emergency interest rate rise to restore stability. What few commentators thought to mention amid this speculation was that this course of action, namely a bigger rise in interest rates, was precisely what the Bank of England had failed to do the previous week alongside the unprecedented QT. They were now being urged to correct what the market saw as their mistake. But the spin was that it was entirely the government's fault. Because we did not know what was going on, and I personally was one step removed in Downing Street, the Bank of England, and no doubt other parts of the bureaucracy, was able to lay the blame for the market turbulence entirely at the government's door. They got the jump on briefing the process, and various former officials swiftly popped up in the media to lay into the mini-budget. A media hungry for political drama, with a Boris-shaped hole to fill, eagerly lapped this up. It sells more newspapers and gets more clicks to talk about pesky politicians getting their comeuppance than to a detailed analysis of the regulatory failings of government bureaucrats. Precisely because they are not elected politicians, they escape any reasonable level of challenge or scrutiny. The other problem was the sheer technical detail involved. A volatile global market spurred by an energy crisis and high levels of government debt, a failure of monetary policy after the financial crash that led to unsustainable printing of money, and a failure to regulate pension funds that led to their near insolvency. It took us days to get to the bottom of it ourselves. For the media, it was far easier and more rewarding to chase the Prime Minister and Chancellor around, pointing the finger and demanding an apology. To date, aside from a report from the House of Commons Work and Pensions Select Committee in June 2023, which was virtually ignored by the media, there has not been a serious inquiry into the failure of the Bank of England or the pensions regulator to properly regulate LDIs, even though this was at the heart of the crisis. The pound recovered throughout Monday, making back its overnight losses and emerging above its closing position the previous Friday. This fact was conveniently ignored amid the frenzied chatter. I met Quasi to discuss the market situation. I was initially opposed to making a statement which I thought would only show weakness and make matters worse. Eventually, after a further meeting that afternoon, I agree the Treasury should announce the date of our planned medium-term fiscal plan, including details of how we intended to get debt falling as a share of GDP. Under pressure, and against my instincts, I also agreed we would commit to publish a forecast by the OBR alongside it. Shortly afterwards, the bank governor, Andrew Bailey, put out a statement saying the Monetary Policy Committee, MPC, which sets interest rates would not hesitate to increase interest rates as necessary to tackle inflation. Despite the fact that the week before, the Bank of England had failed to follow central banks across the world by not raising interest rates enough and implementing QT. While his statement welcomed the government's commitment to economic growth, it also deliberately cast us adrift, stating that the MPC would make a full assessment of the effect of our announcements at its next scheduled meeting. The response from market analysts was hostile, with many expressing disappointment that the bank had not intervened immediately. The pound slipped again, which would be blamed on the government. It's worth stating that the course of Treasury officials and Quasi himself were talking regularly to the Bank of England and the vast majority of the measures we'd taken had been front and centre in my summer campaign. So the claim from the bank's leadership that we were blindsided by the mini-budget simply didn't stack up. It had been a turbulent day. I was frustrated at the apparent inability of the Treasury and the Bank of England to provide reassurance to the markets. They had not forecast the scale of the reaction, nor had they taken sufficient action to avert it. That, in my view, was a failure to do their job. But given the lukewarm nature of the public statements, which implicitly accepted the criticisms made by our opponents, it is unsurprising that the markets were unconvinced. They could see the Governor and the Treasury establishment did not believe in our policies. 
This threatened to turn a market squall into a full-blown financial crisis, and it was obvious that an urgent intervention would be required to avert the disaster of collapsing pension funds. On Wednesday the 28th of September, the governor announced that the bank was setting aside $65 billion to buy up bonds to ease pressure on pension funds and insurance companies. This was more than a complete reversal of the £40 billion QT he had announced on the eve of the mini-budget. Even if you accept the conventional wisdom, the QT programme had almost 20 times more impact than the 45p tax cut. Yet, it was barely mentioned in the media. However, the governor set a time limit of 13 days on this action, which was profoundly unhelpful, effectively creating another cliff edge to the risk. His argument was that he wanted to avoid creating a moral hazard by signalling the bank would bail out bad investments, but it created further problems. This deadline would in due course become crucial. The bank's action averted a financial meltdown, but why had the LDI problem arisen in the first place? Liability-driven investments were the 2022 version of credit default swaps, a product that aimed to reduce risk but actually left its holders open to different, bigger risks down the road. Large investors, like BlackRock, had bought heavily into them as a way of making money when interest rates were low and pension funds were limited in the products in which they could invest. Even the Bank of England's own pension fund had bought into LDIs. The over-reliance on these products was due partly to poor regulation and oversight by the Bank of England and financial authorities and a lack of awareness by the Treasury. But fundamentally, it was the consequence of artificially low interest rates which had been in place since the 2008 financial crash. Since it was harder to get a decent return on investments in those circumstances, risky schemes like these were dreamed up. This was a problem that would have doubtless faced a reckoning at some point, given the inevitable rise in interest rates, but it was our misfortune to be the ones who entered a room full of petrol while carrying a candle. As the week ended, things didn't begin to calm at least slightly following the bank's intervention. But why was that in the guns had been turned on the mini-budget rather than the Bank of England? And why was the fiscal package that was relatively modest compared with previous announcements, such as the cost of the furlough scheme during the pandemic, jumped on with such horror? Furlough cost £70 billion, which was greater than either the energy or the tax package. This, I think, is the key to understanding why I was ultimately unable to deliver on the mandate and why my premiership ended the way it did. I came to realise there is no such thing as the market in this sense. Rather, there are groups of influential individuals in the financial establishment, all of whom know and speak to one another in a closed feedback loop. The Treasury, the Bank of England, and the OBR are deeply embedded in these social and professional networks and share the same belief in the established economic orthodoxy. It is a classic example of groupthink. Over time, this group has moved to the left, adopting net zero goals and diversity targets while arguably neglecting many of their core duties, such as the Bank of England's responsibility to keep down inflation and maintain financial stability. The actions of much of the banking industry have become more politically driven. For example, the interpretation of money laundering regulations has made it harder for right-of-centre politicians and organisations to get bank accounts. In 2023, Nigel Farage, the former leader of the Brexit party, had his account at the exclusive bank accounts withdrawn. It turned out, following an investigation, that this was due to his having, in the bank's view, unacceptable political opinions. The subsequent discussion of his account with a journalist by Dame Alison Rose, chief executive of the NatWest group that owned Couts, led to his resignation. Extraordinary, the financial services regulator, the FCA, failed to identify any legal shortcomings in NatWest group's behaviour. Both the policy makers within government and the broader ecosystem that regulate have a similar worldview, 
and too much vested interest in protecting the status quo. Their concerns are very different from those of the average British citizen. They are global left in outlook and pro-China. They intrinsically believe in big government, high taxes and bloated spending, as they benefit from a large administrative state. Unlike elected politicians, they rarely have to account for these issues, or even of these views. Taken at face value, our plan was a modest fiscal event, particularly given that it was the precursor to a planned spending review and a firm commitment to get debt falling in the medium term, as promised in my leadership campaign. So why was there such an extreme reaction? The obvious answer is that the Treasury establishment and the Bank of England were not on my side. On a personal note, the bank governor himself was clearly annoyed that during the leadership election, I had questioned the bank's mandate and said I would look to review it. Under the Bank of England Act, it is perfectly acceptable for Parliament to examine the bank's mandate, but this was painted as an unacceptable attack on an independent institution, as were my criticisms of the OBR and Treasury orthodoxy. I knew that the economic establishment would resent being challenged, and that I would have to win the argument against them. But I had not appreciated just how ruthless they would be in pushing back by all the means at their disposal. As uniquely influential figures, their signals to the market took on immense significance. It was once said that all the governor of the Bank of England had to do was raise an eyebrow to bring errant financial institutions back into line. While that form of informal regulation is widely believed to have been consigned to history, the governor's eyebrow retains the power to shape opinion and move markets. In our case, it was not just the raising of an eyebrow, but a sustained whispering campaign by the economic establishment, encouraged and fueled by my political opponents in the Conservative Party, who refused to accept my mandate to lead. The signal was given that my agenda was a dangerous heresy that could not be allowed to succeed. I had been prepared for a political battle on the merits of our approach, but what had I not accounted for was the strength of the institutional resistance we faced from the outset. It became a question of who had more power over economic and fiscal policy. The elected politicians or the unelected technocrats? As I soon discovered, the answer was wrongfully clear. It was them. The resistance of the economic establishment was a crucial factor in our failure of implementing the mini-budget but it did not take place in a vacuum. Fundamentally, not enough Conservative MPs supported my agenda, and even those who did were not necessarily prepared to do what it took to get the measures through. In fact, over the course of the previous 13 years, big government Conservatives had been in the ascendant. Many of them were well-connected in the media and spent their time briefing influential journalists which shaped opinion as much as the parallel operation by the economic establishment. From the day of the mini-budget, those Conservatives focused their ire on the abolition of the 45% top rate of income tax. I was surprised to find that Conservative MPs should be so resolute in their opposition to a tax cut, of all things, and especially a cut to an anti-success tax that raised little money and had been deliberately introduced by Labour's Gordon Brown to stoke the politics of envy. This fact pointed to a broader problem with the Conservative Party and what it had come to represent. Ten years earlier, the Conservative Party had supported the reduction of the top tax rate from 50% to 45% without any problems and more revenue had been generated. If anything can be said to demonstrate the extent to which left-wing orthodoxy had influenced British political culture, this was the most striking example. A narrative developed about unfunded tax cuts, even excluding the Laffer curve effect. These tax cuts were less than the spending increases that had taken place. This, I'm afraid, shows how much ground the left has seized. There is hardly ever talk of unfunded spending commitments. Quasi and I probably should have realised this, how would spin by our, our opponents. But we were spending all of our time thinking about reviving the ailing economy. 
In retrospect, the timing of the announcement was also a problem. By unveiling the plan on the Friday, it gave MPs a whole weekend to coordinate their opposition, briefing the press and stirring up trouble. Doing so on the eve of the Labour Party conference also proved troublesome, with the opposition making hay by denouncing the income tax and pledging to reverse it. This allowed Conservative critics to claim it had been a political mistake, a theme readily picked up by the commentary and the optics were bad, they said. Frankly, I was sick of hearing about optics. Since the leadership election, I had made a concerted effort to avoid becoming overly concerned with optics. I had made clear I would be pursuing what I thought was right for the country, even if I was not immediately popular. As Prime Minister, I knew I had to remain focused on that mission. My approach was to perform as best I could in public while making the right decisions in private. I wanted to avoid the trap of becoming obsessed with media coverage. That way lay madness. It was simply not right or possible for me to spend my time personally overseeing and directing the government's media strategy. That was what our professional media strategists and press officers were for. Here, however, I accept that there was a problem of capacity. The civil service media operation, particularly in the Treasury, did not perform as well as it should have in laying the groundwork for the mini-budget. I am still not quite sure why. At the same time, the media team in number 10 were still finding their feet. They did a heroic job, but were battling through an unusually hostile environment. A senior journalist has since told me that part of the problem we faced was a distinct shortage of expert voices supporting our agenda. Broadcasters and press alike struggled to find economists and commentators who could explain what we were trying to do. This was a sign not only of how unfashionable this agenda had become, but of how unfamiliar journalists and MPs themselves were with it. In an ideal world, we would have spent more time providing our allies with materials, lining up supporters and making the case. But the plain reality was that the time and resources had not been available to us. One of my team reported having to explain to a confused journalist the idea that excessively high tax rates can reduce rather than increase revenues. The concept of the Laffer curve is a pretty simple one and had been common currency in political discourse during since the 1970s and 1980s. Yet here we were having to explain it as though it was a novel idea. At least that journalist was trying to understand what we were doing. Too many of the others seemed not even to want to bother. While I was frustrated by the Westminster media, Lobby's refusal to engage seriously with our arguments, they were to a large extent reflecting the prevailing culture at Westminster. Ideas and serious policy nowadays take a back seat to gossip. Plots and intrigue, and there was no shortage of that during this period. Most Prime Ministers, upon taking office, can expect a political honeymoon during which their position is their party at its strongest. For me, there was no such window of opportunity. The Parliamentary Party was deeply divided and had acquired the habits of rebellion and regicide against its leaders. In the space of three years, Theresa May and then Boris Johnson had been brought down by their own MPs, making the position of Conservative Party leader more precarious than had previously appeared. MPs who had remained loyal resented those who had ousted them, and vice versa. We had then been through a bruising leadership contest that further fractured party unity and poisoned personal relationships, and in which more than half the parliamentary party had supported my opponents. Many of them actively wanted to bring me down, and having seen the fate of my predecessors, had high hopes of doing so. Some might say the Conservative Party resembles an underperforming football team that keeps replacing its manager. At some point, it is going to have to consider whether there is a more fundamental problem. One of my cabinet colleagues reflected during the turmoil that the parliamentary party is unmanageable. They say British politics follows American politics, but sometimes the opposite occurs. I remember thinking of this remark when I read about the chaos that engulfed the US House of Representatives when it couldn't elect a speaker.
I am gregarious and I like people, but even my best friends wouldn't describe me as a great people manager. That responsibility lay principally with the chief whip, and I had appointed Wendy Morton to that role, having been pleased with how she had performed in whipping supporters for my leadership campaign. I believe she and Therese Coffey, my deputy prime minister, would be available and able to engage with the newer MPs, keep open the lines of communication with the parliamentary party, and help smooth things over where necessary. They and all the whips did their very best, but from the outset they faced quite appalling behaviour from some of our own MPs. Life was made absolute hell for Wendy and her deputy Craig Whitaker. For example, there was bullying by one colleague over his not being invited to the Queen's state funeral, which resulted in a formal complaint and during course a formal apology by the colleague in question. But that was only the tip of the iceberg. The abuse they and others suffered from day one inevitably had a corrosive effect. I found myself having to spend an increasing amount of time giving pep talks to try and lift their flagging spirits. It helped that I am naturally an uber optimist. But even I found this a strain. By the time I got to Birmingham for the party conference, rebel MPs were pouring kerosene on the market jitters and my poor opinion poll ratings. They fomented a revolt about the 45% tax rate and then moved on to our proposed restraint on the welfare budget. I was struck in my suite on the top floor of the hotel, with people constantly coming and going while having to endure the familiar strains of protesters with loudspeakers outside. It was like a mini Downing Street. I was occasionally led out for a walk, otherwise I was isolated up there with my practice podium for rehearsing my big speech and an endless supply of American pancakes and maple syrup. The conference was one of the few occasions when Francis and Liberty were able to join us. They were smuggled in under the guise of being Welsh young conservatives. Little did the lobby journalists getting into the lifts with Rosie and Molly from Cardiff North knew that they were my daughters incognito. Suffice to say, they had more fun than I did. Up in my suite, I received a number of delegations of colleagues pressing for various policies to be reversed. In particular, the abolition of the 45% income tax rate. The identity of some of them was not a great surprise, but it steadily became clear that even my own supporters had been spooked by the media circus and now surrounded the issue and were not prepared to back it. On that basis, we were unlikely to get the abolition through a vote in Parliament. I thought that rather than let the conference be dominated by this issue, it would be better to lance the boil there and then and back down. Late that Sunday night, I met Quasi and advisers in my room. He was due to give his main conference speech as Chancellor the following day, and it was clear we had to clarify our position before that. We discussed it and agreed that if the policy was dead, we needed to take the hit so now so that we could move on. If we didn't, the whole conference would descend into open warfare. We announced the climb down and Quasi went off to rewrite his speech. I also reflected on what a bizarre turn of events it was for a Conservative leader to face a rebellion against a proposed tax cut, when so often in the past the pressure from MPs on the leadership was for them to promise even more tax cuts. Backing down on the 45% rate eased some of the pressure, but critics moved on to complaining about my plans to restrict benefits and stop the welfare bill from rising so fast. The 45% rate cut had been economically beneficial, but politically contentious. So given the tricky situation, I was prepared to scrap it. But the policy to restrict the growth in benefits to match the average rise in wages rather than inflation was both politically popular and economically beneficial. And I was determined to stick with it. It seemed to be wrong that somebody on welfare would get a bigger pay rise than someone in work and I couldn't for the life of me understand why Conservatives were opposing it. Even Cabinet Ministers felt free to air their misgivings about the possibility that we might not commit to the extra spending. All this rumbled on as I was on a merry-go-round of receptions and events.
The least enjoyable of these was an almost entire day of media interviews, which was even less of an attractive proposition following the U-turn. But it had to be done. More to my taste was the round of parties and receptions, where I got an enthusiastic welcome from the grassroots party members. It was a telling reminder of the disconnect between the MPs in Parliament and the party in the country that had just elected me as their leader. On Wednesday, I made my keynote speech to the conference, renewing my commitment to focus unrelentingly on economic growth and attacking the vested interests of what I call the anti-growth coalition. Somewhat helpfully, some of that coalition decided to show up in person, as I interpreted by environment protesters for Greenpeace. As usual, happens such after incidents. It helped really the audience behind me, with loud cheers as they were all led away. Despite having to acknowledge the 45% U-turn, I was determined not to dilute the message on my merits of tax cuts. As I put it, Cutting taxes is the right thing to do morally and economically. Morally, because the state does not spend its own money, it spends the people's money. Economically, because if people keep more of their own money, they are inspired to do more of what they do best. This is what grows the economy. When the government plays too big a role, people feel smaller. High taxes mean you feel it's less worthwhile working that extra hour, going for a better job, or setting up your own business. That, my friend, is why we are cutting taxes. We need to be internationally competitive. With all our tax rates attracting the best talent, cutting taxes helps us face this global economic crisis. Putting up a sign that Britain is open for business. It was satisfying after a difficult 10 days to be able to set out my stall as Prime Minister, making the case for the things I believed in and which I knew were right for the country. I ended on a note of determination. This mission will be difficult, but it is necessary. We have no alternative if we want to get our economy moving again. I am ready to make hard choices. You can trust me with what to do with what it takes. The status quo is not an option. That is why we cannot give in to the voices of decline. We cannot give in to those who say Britain can't grow faster. We cannot give in to those who say we can't do better. We must stay the course. This was the central message I wanted my party to hear and understand. With just two years until the next general election, we simply had to knuckle down and get serious about the hard work required to turn the economy around. It was warmly received in the hall, and I hoped it had served its purpose in demonstrating to my colleagues that I was determined to carry on with the job I had been elected to do. By the end of the conference, I felt cautiously optimistic that we might have weathered the worst of the storm and that the political situation had stabilised somewhat. The day after the conference concluded, I headed off to Prague for the first meeting of the European political community. The round of meetings with other heads of government and discussions on Ukraine and other pressing international issues rather put the domestic political scene into perspective. When I returned on Friday, a new front had opened up in our battle with the economic establishment. The OBR took its revenge for being sidelined over the mini-budget, sending an email to the Chancellor warning of a £72 billion gap in the public finances on the basis of its latest analysis. This was immediately leaked and briefed to sympathetic journalists with a former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and OBR member trotted out to reinforce the message. The culture of leaking and negative briefing was by now out of control and frankly appalling. Here was a supposedly independent public body apparently engaging in a deliberate abuse of market sensitive information in order to undermine confidence in the government. I was furious at their behaviour and still am. I believe the numbers in their analysis were wrong and so it has since proved. In March 2023, less than four months after the autumn statement, the OBR announced it had overestimated its key metric, public borrowing in five years' time by a staggering £28.4 billion, subsequent figures have shown the OBR to be even more adrift. But in the short term, it had the desired effect. It sparked a further round of meetings in which we were pressed by Treasury officials 
to make further changes to our plans to reassure markets that we'll be able to close this gap through spending reductions or other means. The implication was clear. They believe we should reverse course on the mini-budget. Having failed to stop it in advance, the economic establishment was now seeking to do so after the event. That night, the family and I headed off for our first weekend at Chequers, the Prime Minister's official country residence. The staff were very welcoming, but it was hard to relax. Chequers was at one stage owned by Oliver Cromwell's descendants, and on the upper floor, the Cromwell Corridor was replete with memorabilia. I wasn't in the best frame to mind to enjoy remainders of the English Civil War. On Sunday, Quasi arrived to join my discussions with the political team about how we should proceed in the week ahead. The House of Commons was due to reassemble after the conference recess, and it was clear we would need to mount a charm offensive with the parliamentary party. The issue of benefits operating was set to become the next major headache with scores of MPs now saying they would force a vote and oppose any attempt to peg the increase to earnings rather than prices. Any hope of getting back on the front foot was the short-lived. On Monday morning, the Bank of England announced an increase in the scope of its measures to prop up LDI investments and stop pension funds from going bust. This was made necessary because of nervousness among investors about what would happen at the end of the week when the bank had said its support would end. That drop-off had proved something of a ticking time bomb as far as the markets were concerned. As a further measure to reassure the markets, Quasi announced with my agreement that he would bring forward his medium-term fiscal plan from the planned date of the 23rd of November to the 31st of October, Halloween. This was starting to look like a horror story, given that the OBR forecasts we had pledged to abolish alongside it would now undercut our planned approach to cutting debt. We were now being forced to choose between all manner of unpalatable options on public spending or reversing all the tax announcements from the mini-budget, just to make the numbers fit a forecast we believe to be comprehensively wrong. It was also at this point that we announced the appointment of James Bowler as the new Permanent Secretary to the Treasury. I was personally fine with the choice, having rated him highly while I was Chief Secretary, but I still resented the fact that I had been obliged to block the Chancellor's preferred candidate at the behest of the Bank of Governors, Andrew Bailey, who warned of an adverse market reaction. The following day, it was Bailey himself who caused a market reaction by announcing the LDI support scheme would not be extended beyond the end of the week. This led to the pound immediately falling against the dollar and prodded criticism from fund managers who wanted to see support continue at least until the medium-term fiscal plan had been announced at the end of the month. Bailey made the statement from Washington, D.C., where he was attending the annual meeting of the International Monetary Fund. Earlier in the day, the IMF itself had used one of its reports to renew its earlier criticism of the mini-budget. The IMF had not, as its remit suggested, focused on the mini-budget's impact on the economy or economic stability. Its criticism of tax cuts had been about distribution. Whether the rich would benefit too much, surely a domestic question for the UK government. The pile on attacking the policy included everybody right up to President Biden. I wasn't the only one who thought it was a mistake. He opinioned during a visit to of all places, an ice cream parlour in Portland, Oregon. I think the idea of cutting taxes on the super wealthy at a time when, anyway, I just think I disagree with the policy. This was utter hypocrisy and ignorance. The top rate of federal income tax in the US was 37% and only charged to people earning $539,901 or £483,094 and above. By contrast, the top rate in the UK was 45% and paid by those on more than £150,000. I was shocked and astounded that Biden would breach protocol by commending on UK domestic policy. We had been the US's strong chest allies through thick and thin. It became clear that we were not just challenging UK economic orthodoxy. This group thing extended to the leading powers of the West in America, it had become known as Bidenomics, 
and what the Biden administration and EU and their international allies didn't want was a country demonstrating that things can be done differently, undercutting them in the process. Further evidence of this groupthink is how the supposed growth promoting OECD had been encouraged to develop a minimum tax accord, essentially trying to dampen tax competition and making the West less competitive. Regrettably, the UK had gone along with it. Yet again, after the British public had voted to leave the EU and chart our own destiny, politicians had sided with another unelected international body that would constrain us. Quasi himself, then inse instead on heading to Washington to join the IMF conference, ignored my suggestion that it was not a good time for him to be out of the country. I thought no one in Britain would care that he had missed the IMF conference, and I could see the situation was very fragile. He thought the IMF meeting was more important, and he didn't want to show any panic. The Chancellor and the Prime Minister, not being in the same country, during a time of such tumultuousness would turn out to be a very serious problem. That Monday, I went to visit the England women's football team at their training ground in Twickenham. They had liked the bit in my conference speech where I lamented them I'd been on a plane as a child and be given a junior air hostess badge while my brothers were given junior pilot badges. As female footballers, they too had to break through a lot of prejudice. They said they couldn't really believe they were playing for England and asked me if I could believe I was Prime Minister. I had said that I struggled to comprehend what had happened to me, going from attending a comprehensive school in Leeds to living at number 10 Downing Street. I'd watched them play Germany at Wembley during the summer in the European Championship final. It had been a fantastic break from the campaign as England stormed to victory. It was a nail-biting though with the score standing at 1-1, going into extra time, and the prospect of a penalty shootout hanging over us. I marvelled at how the team had mentally resilient to score a goal in the final 10 minutes. It's all about psych ops, they told me, referring to how they had approached the German team. You have to mess with their minds, they said. Regrettably, that's what my colleagues were trying to do to me back at Westminster. The next day, I faced an ambush of backbench Tory MPs at a meeting of the 1922 committee. The ostensible purpose of the meeting was for me to explain my strategy. Yet, my political opponents mounted a concerted effort to undermine me, asking a barrage of hostile questions and then briefing the whole thing to the media. Naively, I had not even brought a media advisor to the meeting. It was an ugly scene and left even my staunchest supporters rattled. As well as dealing with rebellious MPs, there was also the continuing lack of confidence in the markets. As well as dealing with rebellious MPs, there was also the continuing lack of confidence in the markets. The cabinet room was constantly filled with treasury officials bringing their latest portent of doom. I felt isolated in the face of this onslaught with Quasi away in DC. That Thursday morning, James Bowler came to see me in the cabinet room and delivered a stark warning. If we preserved with our plan to cut taxes, the markets would crash. I also received a warning letter from the cabinet secretary, emphasising this point following this conversation with Bailey. With the Bank of England support for pension funds about to end and the governor refusing to extend it, investors would begin a fire sale of government bonds. We risked a complete market meltdown that would see the government unable to finance its debts. To avoid this, I was told we would have to signal a complete and unambiguous change of direction. That meant a U-turn on corporation tax, reinstating the previously planned increase from 19% to 25%. The mini-budget would end, and my entire economic agenda with it. I knew they had me at gunpoint. This warning was in fact an ultimatum. If I refused to change course, the financial catastrophe they predicted would undoubtedly occur. The culture of leaking and briefing would ensure the markets knew exactly what the bank and the treasury establishment had advised me, and any remaining confidence in the government would evaporate. By presenting the advice in this way, they ensured I had no option but to take it. Throughout the day, I tried to reach Quasi to discuss what had now become an existential crisis for the government.
Still in Washington, at the IMF meeting, he proved difficult to pin down. When I did speak to him, he didn't appreciate the scale of what was happening. He spoke about not panicking and just holding our nerve. It didn't help that he wasn't in the country. Things always look less bad when you're almost 4,000 miles away. Quasi, I told him, I'm being threatened with a market meltdown. This is effing serious. Everyone else on my team had already been convinced to surrender. I had been the last holdout, but I now realised it was a hopeless position. Faced with the prospect of a catastrophic economic meltdown, I had an overriding duty as Prime Minister to do what was necessary to avoid it. However painful it was to abandon policies I believe in and knew it would to be right, that duty came first. With the decision made, I went into full damage limitation mode, operating almost on autopilot. I had to consider what else would be required. There had already been extensive calls from Quasi to be removed, and I couldn't see how he could now credibly present such a major policy reverse of himself. Reluctantly, I concluded that to restore confidence, we needed a new Chancellor who could steady the ship. Appointing another true believer in my agenda would not have cut the mustard. That night, I could hardly sleep. The horse guard's clock chimed every 15 minutes, counting down to the hideous day ahead. I ran through in my mind everything that had happened and was going to happen. My attempts to turn around British economic policy and get the country on the right path had been comprehensively trashed. Ever the optimist, I had been hoping that there would be a more positive turn of events after the relentless stream of bad luck and negativity. But I knew I was running out of road. It was like a game of Tetris where you start losing control and the pieces are getting closer and closer to the top. On Friday morning, as Crosby was flying back to London, I called Jeremy Hunt, the former cabinet minister Boris had been beaten for the party leadership in 2019. He was in Brussels and initially rejected the call. Not recognising the number, when I finally spoke to him and asked him to take over as chancellor, he was somewhat taken aback to say the least. We do not share the same political views, but I had always got on well with him, and I believed he would be able to do what was now required. As Jeremy returned from Brussels, Quasi was flying back from DC. Yet again, I was appalled by a press leak. Quasi learned of his apparent sacking while scrolling through his Twitter feed on his phone while travelling in the car back to central London from the airport. This was deeply regrettable, and I would have much preferred if, just this one time, the incessant urge to leak had been resisted. It was a difficult meeting. We had been friends and political colleagues for more than a decade, and had developed our political agenda together. We had planned this bold economic approach and both still believed in it. Now it was coming to a painful end. I still don't think he realised how bad things had become during his absence. I laid it out for him, stressing that I simply could not risk the British government going bankrupt. I'm sorry Quasi, but I have to do what I can to stabilise things, and that means you going. He was understandably annoyed, and I don't blame him. He said that sacking him wouldn't save me and that they would come for me next. I considered he was probably right, but I now had an obligation to at least try to steady the ship in the short term. That afternoon, I gave a short press conference to announce the U-turn on corporation tax and explain what the new Chancellor and I would be doing to ensure economic stability. I faced the media frenzy alone. It was a pretty ghastly experience which felt a lot like offocating at our own funeral. I was absolutely clear that my economic policy was dead, and most people thought my premiership was too. That weekend, we invited Jeremy and his family to Checkers for Sunday lunch before he and I sat down to go over the announcements that he would make in the Commons the following day. He had uh, very quickly got a hand on the situation and was fully across the details of what needed to be done to calm the markets and provide the necessary reassurance. He had taken to the Treasury very easily, and they to him. That was, of course, the purpose of his appointment. The Treasury establishment had defeated me, so now I had appointed a classic Treasury man as Chancellor. I was no longer in control of economic policy. While our children were playing in the checkers swimming pool, and I was having some time out, I chatted to Hugh on the lawn. He posed the question I hadn't wanted to think about. Given that I had been forced to abandon the policies I had been elected to deliver, what was the point of remaining Prime Minister?
That Monday afternoon, I sat in the House of Commons as Jeremy made his first statement as Chancellor, effectively burying the mini-budget. The remaining tax cuts had not already been reversed, were abandoned, including the cut to the basic rate of income tax, reductions in divided taxis and freezes on alcohol duties, sitting alongside him on the front bench in the Commons was something of an out-of-body experience. As I listened to him shredding the platform on which I had won the leadership election, it was uniquely painful. Immediately beforehand, I had been updated on the mood of the Conservative backbenchers. It didn't take a genius to work out that it was not good. That evening, I sat down to record an interview with the BBC's political editor, Chris Mason, in which I conceded I had gone too far and too fast. With the changes I had sought to make, I repeated this admission in private in meetings with MPs and the Cabinet. There were further such meetings on Tuesday, including one with the anti-EU European Research Group of MPs, who were all very supportive, which was a welcome boost. All the while, people were getting in touch to offer advice on what I should do to reset the government and move on including whom I should appoint to the cabinet and whom I should fire. Few of these suggestions were remotely practical. Even if I had been minded to agree with them, and none of them was likely to have any impact on the situation by that point. If I or any of my team held out hope, then Wednesday the 19th of October put paid to it. It began constructively enough with preparation for Prime Minister's questions, which took up most of the morning. Just before midday, I went over to the House of Commons and went into the chamber for the session. As was now becoming habit, I began by repeating that I was sorry and that I had acknowledged I had made mistakes. But in response to Labour's taunts, I remained the House that I had still delivered on reducing energy bills and cancelling the rise in national insurance rates. It was predictably rowdy, but I thought it went as well as it could have expected given the circumstances. Then, in the afternoon, events took another bizarre turn. I was informed that the Home Secretary, Suala Braverman, had leaked a sensitive draft ministerial statement to a backbench MP in a serious breach of the ministerial code. After a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary, I concluded I would have to ask her to step down and called her to my office to tell her in person. In her place, I appointed Grant Shapps, who had a reputation as a competent media performer and who I suspected would not turn down the opportunity. I was right. This unexpected additional drama meant I had not spent much time thinking about the evening's vote on an opposition motion on fracking. The first I knew there might be a problem was when I was told by the whips that, unusually for a sitting Prime Minister, they really needed me there to vote myself, as it looked like a revolt by Conservative MPs would leave it too close for comfort. After attending my weekly audience with the King, I headed from Buckingham Palace to the Commons for the vote, which we won comfortably. However, it soon emerged that there had been an angry scene during the vote, with our whips openly arguing with MPs and tempers running high all round. I was then told that Wendy Morton and Craig Whitaker, the Chief Whip, and her deputy, had both resigned, saying that they were unable to put up with the abuse they were getting. I spoke to Wendy and Craig in my office, and urged them not to resign. It was clear that it would only exacerbate the house of cards falling down. They were very emotional, and there had been very much confusion. Including trouble stirred up by our opponents, I eventually persuaded them, but they insisted on a statement going out. It was surreal. With my team, I headed over to the whip's office, and found it in utter chaos, seeing the books of despair on the faces of colleagues all around the commons that night. I just thought to myself, this is done. This is terminal. We went back to number 10, where we then had to deal with the fallout from the vote and confirm that Wendy and Craig had now unresigned. Once all that was finally sorted, I went up to the flat. By that time, I had more or less decided that my only option was to resign. I had already done what was needed to avoid an economic meltdown, but the political meltdown of the Conservative Party now appeared unstoppable. I didn't sleep much that night either, and in the morning I still felt the situation was impossible. I went down to the cabinet room and spoke to my chief of staff, Mark Fulbrook, and Nick Castoras, my private secretary. Both of them reluctantly agreed that my time was up. I went back up to the flat to speak to Hugh, 
who told me that I would have regretted never running for leader and trying to do the things in which I believed, but that I wouldn't regret leaving now that it had proved impossible. He was right. I went back to the cabinet room for a meeting with Jeremy. In a last twist of the knife from the market whisperers, the Chancellor told me that my going was now the price the markets wanted. It didn't matter. I didn't need another push. I was going. The only questions were around timing and the arguments from choosing my successor, which I started to discuss with them. I asked Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 Committee of Conservative MPs, to come over, and I told him my decision. He said, a new leader of the Conservative Party could be chosen in place by the end of the following week. Only until then would I remain Prime Minister. Decision made, I telephoned His Majesty the King to inform him personally. He was as kind and sympathetic as ever. Then the cabinet room started to fill up as close colleagues joined my senior officials and the political team. Hugh came down and spoke to them as we worked on drafting my public statement. There was much agreement that the situation had become inevitable, and that the party had become ungovernable. Hugh helpfully reminded me that he said in July that leading the Conservative Party was an impossible job that no one would want to do. A last-minute phone call came in from Liberty, calling on me not to resign from the middle of her school playing field. I had to say it was too late. At 1.30pm, I went out to the lectern outside number 10 and announced my resignation as leader of the Conservative Party. I reiterated that I had been elected with a mandate from the party to change the direction of the government and deliver economic growth. Given I could no longer fulfil that mandate, it was right for me to go. I was angry and frustrated that I had come to this, but by that stage the overriding feeling was one of relief. The whole experience as Prime Minister had been quite surreal, and my resignation seemed like just another dramatic moment in a very strange film in which I had somehow been cast. We spent a last weekend at Chequers, where we gave a farewell party for friends. The following Tuesday, I chaired the cabinet for the last time before leaving number 10 to see the King and formally tender my resignation as Prime Minister. The first leadership hustlings had been held at Elland Road, the home ground of Leeds United, the local team during my childhood. In my speech there, I made reference to Don Reeve, the legendary manager of the 1970s Leeds team that won the league and who then went on to manage England. The team was known as Dirty Leeds, and opposing fans accused them of violence and cheating. Brian Clough then took over for the Reeve at the club in 1974, as dramatised in the film The Damned United. Clough tried to shake up the team and get them to play better. Well, I might as well tell you now. You lot may all be internationals and have won all the domestic honours there, are to win under Don Reeve, but as far as I'm concerned, the first thing you could do for me is to chug all your medals and all your caps and all your pots and all your pans into the biggest effing dustbin you can find because you've never won any of them fairly. You've done it all by bloody cheating. The players rebelled and Cloth was sacked after just 44 days. In the final days of my premiership, I had said to my private secretary, Nick Castoras, if the Conservative Party bin me after six weeks and I'm the Brian Clough of Prime Ministers, then so be it. I lasted 49 days. So what did I learn from my time at Downing Street? The main lesson I drew is about the sheer power of the administrative state and its influence on the markets and the wider polity. I had not understood until I became Prime Minister how painful these people are. The 49 days in Downing Street taught me more about that than the previous 10 years in government. I sat in cabinets under David Cameron, Theresa May and then Boris Johnson. All the while, growing frustrated over how slow progress was and how nothing much seemed to get done. I thought that with a clearer sense of direction and a more assertive attitude. It would be impossible to change things as I saw them. To challenge the prevailing orthodoxy, and I realise that was not the case. What I now understand is that in government, you have a choice. You can either go along with the orthodoxy, or you get booted out. That was essentially what had happened to me at the Ministry of Justice 
when I try to challenge the established order. The powerful vested interests there pushed back, made my life very difficult and ultimately got me fired. I had assumed that they were only able to do that because I wasn't at the top. What I now realise is that even when you are supposedly at the top, they can still do it. That is frankly scary. What we saw in September and October 2022 was a government that sought to challenge the prevailing economic orthodoxy being prevented from doing so by those who had created and defended that orthodoxy. The economic establishment used its huge and unrivaled influence over the markets to undermine confidence in the elected government, stir up political resistance and force it to change course. The only way to counteract this is with vast amounts of political capital and that was in short supply when I was elected. I faced a conservative party that after 12 years in office was fractious and split. They were not willing or able to collectively to back a bold programme. Many of my critics said I presided over instability, and that is of course true. The case I want to make is that in the current British political system, achieving change without instability is nigh on impossible. Given the legacy of 25 years of economic consensus, and the now ossified system protecting it, Maintaining stability means going along with the status quo. I regret that we have lost out on benefits for the country that could have been delivered. Server analysis suggests that if my plans are kept going, GDP growth would be 2% higher by 2030. Investment would not have faltered in the North Sea were it not for the windfall tax. We would have got moving on fracking and lower energy bills would have been on the horizon. A more competitive rate of corporation tax would have persuaded the likes of AstraZeneca to open new plants in Britain. Instead, we were stagnating. Whether you are agreeing with what you are trying to do or not, the turn of events is worryingly anti-democratic. We now have unaccountable institutions that are more powerful than elected politicians. That poses a fundamental problem for parties across the political spectrum that seek to challenge the status quo. Despite the political failings to which I own up, we have a fundamental institution and governance problem, especially over our economic destiny. When we lifted the rock of EU rules, what was underneath was a pretty sight. Or should I say, a very ugly sight. <laughs> Hello? Yes it is Christine, were you trying to ring earlier? It's it's uh, it's Auntie Christine. I'll put. Uh, shall I put the? Okay. Democratically elected politicians are sidelined in a system that is run up by a group of thinking orthodoxy. Simply put, there needs to be a greater democracy and accountability, and conservative politicians desperately need to find their economic compass. If there's one thing I want conservatives to understand from this book, it is that there is no smooth way to achieve the change the country and the wider West needs. No amount of pitch rolling and messaging can avoid what will be a messy and chaotic battle against some deeply embedded vested interests and those on our own side who seek to appease them. We have to be brave, and we have to take risks in order to win this fight. It will mean taking on powerful institutions that resist every step of the way. I sometimes wonder if I should have gone with the grain more, bided my time, and with two years to go on until an election, we didn't have time. We had already failed to deliver change for too long, and it wasn't getting any easier. Every day that went by made it harder to challenge orthodoxy thinking. 
In reality, the only choice I had was whether to act as I did or try to stay in office and simply manage as well as I could within the accepted orthodoxy. Tweaking things in the right direction and stopping the worst excesses of the woke brigade and the eco-extremists. I wasn't prepared to do that. The West was in trouble and we had a real opportunity to do something about it. The real calamity would be if I were still in number 10, going along to get along while Britain descended further into the abyss.